Hello. This is Daniel. This will be a brief demo of the clay tool for data visualization and literate programming in Clojure. And last time we saw how we could use it with VS Code and Calva. And today we'll see how we use it with Emacs and CIDA, this wonderful environment for yeah. developing closure. Clay itself is in alpha stage, but not for long. Very soon it will stabilize and we are mostly looking for your feedback at this time. I'll share the screen and we'll have a brief demo in a realistic use case, so to speak. So you see my editor and the browser now, and here the editor is Emacs. And we have this Emacs scratch buffer where we can write Emacs list. So first we need to bring the clay package and one way to do it is the Emacs package called use package. And we can call it to bring clay using straight. And we need to specify a few details. We are bringing it from the GitHub repo. Which is this one. So when we evaluate that in Emacs, we get the clay package. So now when we do meta X, we get all those clay slash functions of, of different natures. Maybe I'll make the font a bit bigger. So you see you have clay slash all kinds of things. And let us create a small closure project we may play with. So we can do that in Emacs list as well. We we'll make a directory, call it demo, and we will go to that directory. Here we are. Let's create a closure dex.even file. And in this file, we'll have two dependencies. One of them is clay. And the other, the other one, the other one is something that you don't need to use clay, but it will just bring a few relevant dependencies. It is this work in progress library we call Nodge. Nodge is collecting a few of the relevant dependencies for data science in a bundle and also adding some uh, functionality on top of them. So. We will use it just to make our case more interesting. So here is our devs.eden. So now we can jack into a REPL. Oh, sorry, I said save this file and jack in. Uh, oh, all right, I had a typo. So let us rename it. Now we can jack in. And we will create the notebooks. Oh, sorry, directory. And in the notebooks, we'll create uh, Clojure namespace called Scratch. Here we'll have our code. And our REPL is running already. We can compute, right? We can evaluate. And and now let us see clay in action. So what we do is call the clay meta x, right? Clay slash make namespace HTML. And this will make an HTML file out of this namespace and send it to clay to be visualized. You see? Our namespace is used as a notebook. 
as HTML. It's just an HTML file with some text. And now we can just keep going. And so maybe we'll first make the, the situation a bit more interesting. So, you know, maybe we can do some image processing. Here is the Wikipedia uh, entry about clay and has this nice image and we can bring that image, right? So we can copy the address and we may load that. To load it, we we'll use a namespace out of the famous dtype next library. For handling buffered images. So right, we may define our raw image as buffed image load of this URL. Right. And we have our image. Let us, uh, you know, explore what we have. So, what is it? It is a Java object of the buffered image class. What type of image is it? So, we have this convenient function for checking that image type. It is byte PGR. So, we have one byte for blue, one byte for green, one byte for red, right? At each pixel. And yeah, and also, of course, all this can be visualized as our namespace. So, right, coming back to the clay view, I can call this clay slash make a namespace HTML function again and get the namespace rendered. Can we see the image? So I'll call the same function again in Emacs. I have a key binding for it. So I don't need to open the menu. And now we have our image rendered in the notebook. And another thing we may do is just render one value, you know, like evaluate and render one closure form. So it is just another function, clay slash make last S expression, right? So we can just see this image, this value, or any other value. Let us keep going. So we may you know, try to make this a bit more organized, the title to the namespace. New subsections. And we can render again by a key binding. And also, we may render it a bit differently. Clay slash make namespace quarto HTML. This kind of rendering goes through the tool called Quarto. You need Quarto installed in your system, Quarto. And you may install it and, and get this nice rendering with lots of customizations and kind of choosing the style and font and theme and all that. And it's just a different flavor of rendering. Could be a bit slower depending on your case. Quoto may allow for yet another way of rendering. So we may say clay slash make namespace Quoto reveal JS. So this will give you a reveal JS slideshow. Right, so you can kind of travel between your slides, which are just the subsections of, of your notebook. Right, just a reveal JS slideshow. Great. So here we are. This is our um, namespace for now. And let us now practice some data processing, image processing. But basically, that's it. That's clay. And you may enjoy it. And we're looking for your feedback. Now we just try to make the story a bit more realistic and try to do something with this image. So images can be handled as data. Thanks to DTAC Next, you may 
convert an image to a tensor data structure. So you may take your raw image and say, graph image as u bytes tensor. And let us print this in Emacs. Right, so you see it is this tensor structure, like an array with a shape with three different dimensions. Let us explore this one. So we'll bring a few other namespaces here from the dtype next library. dtype is the general de tech data type namespace for working with arrays. And there is one for tensors, these arrays with the shape, like this rectangular, this uh, kind of box-like shape of three dimensions here. And let us also, sorry. Oh. Also, let us bring the functional namespace that has all kinds of um, functions you may apply to your arrays and tensors. Oh, oh sorry, thank you. Right, so we have these namespaces. So now you may ask, you know, let us define this as the, our raw tensor. We we'll use it again and again. Def once to avoid loading. This can be def once as well, right? And so raw tensor is this structure. What is the shape of that? We may ask the deep type namespace raw tensor. This is the shape, right? It has the height and width, or width and height, I never remember. And the three, the three is about the three color channels, blue, green, and red, right? How do we know these are blue, green, and red? Remember the image type, BGR, blue, green, and red. So now, we may compute with this structure. Let us maybe try to make the image darker. Right? So you may begin with your raw tensor. And apply a multiplication function to the whole tensor using the d type next efficient arithmetic functions, and now you see the numbers are smaller, so the image will be darker, but this is a tensor, not an image, so we need to turn it back to a, an image to be, to be displayed. So uh, at the Nodge library, we currently have a function for that. Nodge is adding some convenience functions on top of the famous data science libraries, and uh, this is still alpha stage, and some of these functions may eventually find themselves in the original libraries. But for now, we have a tiny function here to um, turn tensor into an image. And the image type is byte. BGR, as we learned earlier. Can we see this image? Key binding, send it to clay, right? Yes, it is darker. May, we may wish to compare, so maybe let us have them both in one vector. And you see they are both rendered in one vector, and you see we may compare them. Yes, we could make it darker. Let's keep going, maybe. So. Uh, Maybe we wish to kind of make it a bit more informative and organize things in an HTML-like way. So we may use the hiccup uh, notation where we may have a, a div, a, a div that's a rectangle. And inside we may have uh, a few things. So we may have the subtitle um, saying uh, raw. 
image, and then the raw image, and another subtitle, darkened image, and then this one. Right? And to make that render as HTML, we need to use to we need to tell clay that this is of kind hiccup. So we use kindly. Kindly is a library, a tiny library for requesting kinds of visualizations. So we may say kind hiccup here and send all of this to the browser. And you see now we kind of got this organized nicely in a clearer way, possibly. Now, what about those color channels we have talked about? Can we separate them? So let us take our raw tensor, remember this one, and use the dtype next function. Sorry, slice where? Slice right. So we'll take the rightmost one dimension, which is the color channel, right? We have three dimensions. So the rightmost one is this three, the three color channels. And we get three slices, right? Let's check. Maybe let us define this as the color channels. How many are they? Three, right? And what are they, the shapes? All of them are of the same shape, the same height and width of the original image, but they all lost the third dimension because we did separate this dimension out. We did slice the tensor, if it makes sense. Can we see one of them? Let us try. So to do that, we need to compute a new tensor that will keep only one of the channels. And a very general function to compute tensors is compute tensor. We need to tell it the shape. So the shape will just be the same shape of the original. And we need to give it a function that will take i, j, and k, the three components, the, uh, the three dimensions we are going along. And for every entry of the tensor, it will compute the value. So what should it be? So let us see. We need to check whether it is or it is not the red component. So if k equals two, right, the, you know, if zero is blue, one is green, then two is red, right? So if it is the red component, we may keep the original value of the tensor. Otherwise, we'll just make it zero. We'll just turn off the other components, the other channels. Right? So let's see what that is. Oh, we need to tell it we're creating unsigned bytes, basically. And got the new tensor structure. Actually, a sequence, never mind about that. It is the way it is printed. But you see, now the blue and green are zero. We just kept the red. Let us turn that into an image again. As we did earlier. Right? Just the red, just the red channel of our structure. Let us continue just a little bit and maybe try something a bit more detailed. Uh, what if we wish to make the whole picture dark? but keep the blue bright, right? Remember our image is 
very much blue in some parts and very not blue in other parts. So can we kind of handle these different parts differently? Let us try. So we will compute again just a different function. And this different function, we have to check whether we, we are in, an, in a region which is blue or not. To do that, we just compare the green and the blue. Let us try. So let us check if the green at this, uh, this i and j is bigger than the blue in i and j. Right? And if it is, we will make it darker because it is, it is considered as not a blue region, not a blue area. So let us make it darker. Otherwise, we just keep it the same. So actually, you know, all we are changing is this multiplier. So maybe let us keep it 0 0.3 and otherwise 1 and multiply that by the raw by jk. Let's visualize this. And so some things will be made darker, others will not. Oh, something is not right. All oh, right, because we haven't defined the color channels. So let us go back. Well, we computed the slices, right? So let's give them names. Blue will be number zero. Green, number one. And red, number two. Just those different slices. Now this piece of code came back. Sorry, I forgot to do that. So it kind of worked, right? It got darker, but the blue remains kind of bright. Something feels wrong at the edges. It looks like our condition might not be just right. Mm -hmm. Maybe we were too aggressive in picking the areas to be made darker. So let us try to be just a bit less aggressive. So maybe we'll kind of require the green to be 20% bigger than the blue for uh, like as a decent cr criterion to make things darker. Yeah, a bit better, right? So now, yeah, it is dark, but the blue is bright. Maybe just for fun, we may kind of play with varying these values, or this would be a Varying uh, variable. Okay. I'll go through a sequence like the sequence and map over these values. And here we may have like a vector with a factor and this whole computation. Yeah. I think it makes sense. So, you know, you see, we're just demonstrating this kind of interactive experience, exploring things and varying our values and seeing how. Uh, they affect the result, and we can keep going. And also, all this is a notebook. So we may now render through the quarto key binding, and may take some time depending on your values. So if you need something quick, then you may prefer not to go through quarto. But when you wish to kind of be careful with the styling and so on, then quarto is a great option. And you see, we got everything as a is a notebook with the table of contents. It is just HTML with some text and images. And yeah, and maybe what we can uh, do now is look at the thing we have generated and try to realize, is it just HTML? So 
we will go to the docs directory that was just generated and see, yeah, we have this scratch.html file. It's just an HTML file with some relevant JavaScript and CSS, just um, hopefully the minimum we need and, and images and so on. And, and there are also the scratch files with all the necessary data and images and, and CSS and JavaScript and so on. And basically that's that we are generating things like that and you can push them to the web and serve them as notebooks and slideshows. And actually books, Quoto does have great book support. We'll cover it some other time. And all of this is supported through Clay. Yeah, so this was a brief demo using Clay from within Emacs Cider. Uh, personally, I use Kogi. Kogi is a certain um, uh, uh, Emacs uh, distribution or Emacs uh, setup by Arne and friends. And it has those nice key bindings and kind of harmony, lightweight harmony around all the details that I care about, which are mostly around closure. So for me, this is the way I use Emacs. Um, but you know, you can bind your functions to your keys and so on. Really looking to hear your feedback. And I hope to meet you soon. And um, take care and uh, thank you so much. We'll have more of these demos hopefully soon. Goodbye.